John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I f***ing love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that buzz next. Big jab there from Duffy and Fred Fear is hurt now. Oh, Duffy, 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 They're a couple of absolutely self-involved bullshit artists. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. Give me the live. <laughs> no more live to take, Ken Flo. Give me the live on a Monday. Happy tax day. Monday, April 15, 2024, episode 482 of the Anik and Florian podcast. UFC 300 is in the can. We are live. We're going to start going live twice a week, ladies and gentlemen, not just to commemorate events like UFC 300. I got an extra pep in my step today, Ken Flo. It's good to see you, buddy. It was great to see you in Vegas. Anakin Florian podcast on location. How are we feeling? Likewise, man. The live shows just feel different. Energetically, it's different. And I imagine for UFC 300, man, it must have been amazing. What a card. Rarely, you know, you see this huge buildup for all these fights, you know, top to bottom. It was the biggest card, I think, in UFC history. Um, and sometimes they don't always deliver. This one definitely did that. It certainly had everything and it was laid out beautifully by the promotion. And it's always fun for us to look to our right while we're broadcasting these events and to our left to see the UFC executives and the UFC matchmakers and their responsiveness to a given fight that they have put together. Even a fight like Bobby Green and Jim Miller. Promotionally, they were adamant four times to put that fight together. And man, Bobby Green uh, was leaking blood of Jim Miller all over that octagon. And it just sort of snowballed from there. A tremendous show. We're going to recap the ever living fucking daylights out of it with you today. We're also going to talk to Ray Longo. We'll ask him uh, how it felt to have the only winning fighter boot at UFC 300. No, I'm just kidding, but I'm going to give it hard to Ray Longo (laughs) as I usually do. Uh, He'll join us at the bottom of the hour. And uh, we are hoping to be with you for a couple hours today, live on the Anakin Florian podcast channel, DraftKings YouTube channel as well. And we will get into all things UFC 300 headlines brought to you by Cuervo. Now's a good time to enjoy the tequila that invented tequila. So kind of feels like I need to begin the Ray Longo minute with Max Holloway and not Aljamain Sterling and kind of feels like I should begin the show with Max Blessed Holloway and not the UFC light heavyweight champion, Alex Padeda, Ken Flo. I mean, you're sort of the A side of this podcast. Three times you fought for the UFC title. Tough for us, Team Florian folks, that you never brought that home, actually. But um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, I mean, where do we even begin? I guess I would just start with being so... You know, attitude of fucking gratitude just for this live event and this fan base and this fight week and what this sport has built into to be able to have a showcase like this. And, uh, you know, you're going to be hard pressed to find an MMA card on paper with this type of depth. I would say probably until like 2032, UFC 400, maybe not. I mean, the Conor McGregor pay-per-views are enormous. Noche UFC is going to be huge, but it's just hard to have a collection of talent come together like this and stay together like this. And then to execute a show like that, uh, we're very happy it's in the can, you know? Absolutely. It just felt, it felt big to me just watching at home on television. And it really starts to become this celebration by the UFC itself on this amazing milestone of 300 pay-per-view events. You know, again, I was around for UFC 100. That felt like a big deal. It was a celebration of putting on 100 pay-per-view events. And now we're at 300. Yeah, and, and just being out there in fight week again, every time I'm there, it's a huge reminder of how big this sport has become, John. You've been able to see it. You're on the ground all the time. But I'm curious, where do you kind of rank this as far as the energy specialness of all the events that you've called, where would you kind of put this? Did it feel big? It felt big. Just watch it. Oh, it felt enormous. Uh, yeah. As I said, we're glad this one's in the goddamn can can flow. Yeah. It's hard sort of to put these things in proper context, especially a few days removed from it. Uh, You know, it didn't have that International Fight Week Hall of Fame backdrop. I think immediately you start to think about Conor McGregor pay-per-views, and the biggest show I had called prior to this one was UFC 229 in 2018, Conor McGregor versus Khabib Nurmagomedov, and the biggest fight in UFC history singularly, and I think that probably still holds, right? Then ends, and there's a brawl that plays out, right? So I don't know that anything... uh, And then I got in trouble with the law later that night, actually. So I don't know that anything will top UFC 229. But UFC 300 is certainly right there. It just felt enormous, and we 
just uh, undertook, I think, a lot to try to uh, to over and not under deliver. And uh, these broadcasts can take on a life of their own. But yes, in terms of the athletes and uh, Davis and Figueroa walking out at three twelve p.m. Pacific, it was everything and then some. And even if you think about singular moments during the night, you know, Jan Shaunan being choked nearly or slash right. half unconscious at the end of round one, and everything that that fight had. And we won't get to that for probably forty five minutes. So let us get into it if we could. And um, since you know, when Kenny was at uh, ESPN, sometimes we did call him K Swiss because he didn't like making fight picks, right? K Switzerland. So you didn't necessarily lead a horse to water. So I'm going to lead the program with Max Blessed Holloway if I could. And if you had told Dana White and the UFC brass that the BMF title fight would have ended uh, this way, uh, you just couldn't have possibly jotted up any better. And even anyone who was lukewarm to the origination of the BMF title fight, Kenny, this sport needs to crown. It's bad motherfuckers, and in this case, the baddest motherfucker is Max Blessed Holloway, and uh, certainly he's worthy of that distinction. And as Joe Rogan said on the broadcast, you know, this win essentially takes him from arguably the greatest featherweight of all time to one of the all-time greats. And I'm glad that, uh, not that he needed it, but I'm glad that he's now in that conversation. What a huge moment in a career full of them for, uh, for Max Blessed Holloway. Isn't it so interesting how one performance can change the, the trajectory of your career in a lot of ways and can change the narrative extremely quickly. Now, were these guys both bad mother effers to begin with? Absolutely. This was deserving. Wait, why won't you say title. it? Are you a role model? Uh, no, like, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's just bad motherfuckers. I have no, there problem. he is. Everybody. All right. All right. Oh, there so these is. guys are as bad as it gets, right? This, this fight was the one I was most excited about. Um, and let's take away the ending. If it didn't have that insane ending, everyone still should be kind of bowing down to Max Holloway. And it was a great reminder for me because I was not wrong, dead wrong about this fight. I thought Gaethje had this one in the bag. And certainly it's not a great way to start a fight by getting your nose broken at the end of round one. Now, that's never a good thing. Badly, badly. Um, however, this was a masterful performance from Max Holloway. And similar to Aljo, which we will get to, I think this weight class allows him to utilize the tools that he is so good at. He has the energy. He has the strength at 155 pounds to execute it when he needed to. Now, it was a decimation. He picked Gaethje apart, aside from maybe round four, which he probably lost. Holloway was on fire. He was utilizing all the right tools. The only knock maybe on this one was he probably took too many leg kicks. All right. Okay. Whatever. Going against Gaethje. But as far as what he was doing with his hands, with his movement, defensively, this was the best Max Holloway I'd ever seen. Now he decided to throw that all away with 10 seconds. I wouldn't have done it. Right. Uh, maybe it's because I'm a wimp or I just wanted to hold on and get that win in my pocket. Establish myself as that bad motherfucker. I beat that guy. Okay. Holloway goes, no, I'm beating him the whole time, and I'm willing to throw it away and just go, all right, now this is for the bad motherfucker belt. Right now, we're going to see, I established myself as the better fighter. Now, let's see who the baddest motherfucker is. And he decided to go there, throw the dice, and then knock out Gaethje a guy who was known for his knockout power in that range, he was better than him. I did not expect that. Now, there's some luck involved there. Could have gone the other way maybe, so there was risk involved. But for Max Holloway to be able to be willing to do that and knock Gaethje out face first into the canvas with one second left in round five, you couldn't write a script better than that. You would watch a movie and go, no, that would never happen. Not right, like that. Right. No, it did. Yeah. So Max Holloway, maybe the greatest volume boxer in UFC history. He's known for a lot of things. Greatness, never knockout power per se. He had the recent knockout against Chan Sung Jung, the Korean zombie. And, you know, say what you want about that. A tremendous highlight, but not this. And maybe at that point of the fight, Max Holloway doesn't think that Justin Gaethje is capable of finishing him. But no, right? Like he's done this before. He pointed to the center of the octagon against Ricardo Lamas at UFC yeah. 199. This is just the cloth from which he is cut and just couldn't happen to a better dude, man. I just, I can't even believe it. I worried about being able to properly articulate myself on this show today, not because we're live, but because 
I'm a fan of this sport. And it's just like, dude, like Dana says, we sell holy shit moments. And it's like, dude, I had to be sharp when this happened on Saturday night. Today, I don't have to be like, dude, holy shit. Like, are you serious? The BMF title fight's going to end with Justin Gaethje face first on the canvas with one second to go after an epic 24 minutes and 59 seconds. I mean, come on, man. It's like how many people didn't watch mixed martial arts before UFC 300 and are forever hooked? Like come to a live event. I dare you. It'll ruin your marriage. That's why you give those bonuses out to guys like Max Holloway. Again, that's just what we know. But um, uh, imagine what he he made or what he's worth to be willing to do that stuff. You know, this is from a business perspective, not from a strategical, uh, tactical uh, standpoint, but just from being an entertainer and going, I got a Max Holloway that fights for me. And I know if I put him out there when the lights are brightest, he will shine bright as well. And I think he may shine brightest at 155 pounds. Now, maybe that's the case. But I, I would say this. I saw an evolution in his game on a technical level. He just seemed sharper. He wasn't eating the same shots that sometimes he, you know, when he goes out there and decides to trade in the pocket, sometimes you'll see Max Holloway eat a lot of shots, take a lot of damage. This was not the guy that fought Dustin Poirier. And say what you will, to me, yes, he was probably stronger and in better shape, all that stuff. But this is a different – the coaches over there – with Max Holloway deserves so much credit because they're not the names that people are throwing around. Even me, I, I couldn't come up with their their names right now as coaches, but whatever it is they deserve. It's uh, Gracie Techniques, I think. Michael Nakagawa, there's a lot of unheralded guys. Darren Yap on the strength and conditioning side. And he's, and he he's a loyalist different. too. He looked different. And again, the class that he showed, the respect that he showed to Gaethje, and then obviously the ending of that fight, everything – it proved me wrong because I said, you know what? I don't know if he is miss. I thought he was kind of losing a step. Now, is it because maybe he wasn't ready to make that evolution in his game? Or is it the weight class at 145 pounds that is preventing him to look as good as he hopes, right? Is he cutting too much weight? I don't know what the answer is. Maybe it's a little bit of both of dialing in that weight cut. And now he's a different fighter technically and, and tactically. But this was the best Max Holloway I've seen in a very long time. And it was a great reminder to me, hey, man, give these guys a chance. Even as many fights as he's had, they still can evolve. And that's because Max Holloway is not only a fighter, but he's a martial artist as well. There was a time, and not all fighters are both fighters and mixed martial artists. That's for damn sure. Right. Uh there was a time, 2017, 2018, when we were still with Fox, Max Holloway did an interview with you, I believe, and Michael Bisping, and was oh having a real hard time, and the weight cut was part of it, and a lot of people were burying him at that point in time. So I certainly think he has now found his correct weight class. And when you hearken back to the wins over Jose Aldo in Brazil and all of the epic triumphs for Max Holloway prior, this is the biggest win of his career, singularly. He beat a prime Justin Gaethje as well, who had just disposed of Rafael Fazeev and Dustin Poirier. Justin Gaethje, if he had broken his foot during this training camp, it stands to reason his next fight would have been against Islam Akasha for the undisputed UFC lightweight championship. Justin Gaethje deserves boatloads of credit, not just for his role in this ultimate highlight at the end of the fight, but for accepting this fight, for defending a belt yes. that had never been defended before. Yeah, you can say he... he he cleared five million probably net on the night or something like that, right? As a pay-per-view point earning defending champion, right? But Justin Gaethje deserves a lot of credit. And Max Holloway beat, I think, as close to the best version of him. You're right, the nose break factor prominently in all of this, but um just a huge stock raising win for Max Holloway. And yet in one part, I sort of wonder aloud why he needed a win like this. Certainly not the highlight, right, with the one second, but why did for me, he need this win to be in that conversation as as the greatest, you know, of all time. One of the greatest fighters of all time, Kenny. And he set himself up now to be a contender or title challenger in two weight classes. Oh, with yeah. With one fight, with one performance. And again, it's a, another reminder. You can change the trajectory of your career with one strike, with one performance. Let's go back to Masvidal, who was fighting for years. He does a flying knee over Askren, and now he's the biggest thing in mixed martial arts, right? So, again, it, it, it's so interesting how you can change a narrative very, very quickly. Um, and, you know, Max Holloway has always been that dude. But, you know, questions start to arise. Can he still do that? He's been fighting a long time. He's had a lot of wars. 
Max Holloway is still at the top of his game, man. That was just unbelievable. I also think at this point, even though I do think he is his best version at 55, I think he's got a great chance to beat Ilya Topuri at 45, and I think that's going to be the next fight for Max Holloway for the undisputed UFC featherweight championship. Ideally, title defense number one for Topuri in Spain, potentially. I don't know. Maybe it would be Noche UFC. Who knows exactly when and where that fight will be. But, Kenny, this obviously positions Max Holloway for three belts. He could defend his BMF belt. Shail Sonnen wants to see him do that. I don't think that's the next move at all. But he could also be a number one contender for two titles. I think he's going to fight Ilya Topuria. You do have a little bit of a different situation at lightweight. You already have a title defense announced for Islam Akashev against Dustin Poirier, UFC 302 on June 1st. And then you also have Armand Sarukian lurking, who presumably is going to wait now and idle and maybe be next for the winner of that fight. But if Poirier beats Makashev, then that throws a wrench into a lot of different plans. Talk to me about what is next for uh, for Max Bless Holloway, whose world uh, it is right now. Yeah, well, I, I'm kind of thinking on this, I guess, on the same level uh, of Chael in some ways, in that you have this BMF belt now, right? And there's some questions as to what weight class he should be at. He wants to fight against Topuria. Well, again, I know we talked about, you know, title title winners defending their belt first before moving on to anything else. Would a happy medium be the BMF belt against Topuria at 150 pounds? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe they fight in the middle. And then if he was to win that fight, Topuria retains, still retains his featherweight belt, and then he goes and does it at 145 pounds. I don't know. It's something that he's going to have a, have to have a conversation about because you could also argue, hey, man, um, he can go in there and challenge for the belt against uh, Islam Mahashev at some point. I, there's a lot of options for him, um, and this is all because of Max. Um, but if I'm being honest, the fight against Toporia, whether it's some kind of catch weight, which I'm sure the UFC won't be crazy about, yeah. but there is this BMF belt that he has now, so you could justify it that way. But I yeah. think... The fight against Toporia at 145 pounds. We need someone who can challenge Toporia. And Holloway, for me, is, is the guy that stands out. And for Volk, he needs to take time away anyway, in my opinion. So yeah. we'll, we'll see what happens. Right. Well, full stop for me with respect on Topuria right now fighting for the BMF belt. And not to say that Ilya Topuria is Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, like a guy who could never fight for that BMF belt, right? And I say that with all due respect, right? You can't be like Mr. Congeniality, some super nice right. guy, right? right? Alex Morono is not going to fight for the BMF belt, you know? He's just too nice, right? <laughs> but I just don't know. Like Ilya Topuria, I just don't think he's deep enough into his career, right? right for a BMF type of showcase, right? I think you could go Conor McGregor, Max Holloway for a BMF belt. And I think Max Holloway can make 45. I'm not going to say with relative ease, Kenny, at this point in time, but he's looked progressively better, remarkably, making that weight as he has gotten older. The last few times, he really has looked good. He's won two straight fights at featherweight. Yeah. So I think you got to go undisputed featherweight championship, Max Holloway versus Ilya Topuria. And if Max wins that fight, depending on how the calendar works and health is wealth, I'd like to see Max Holloway at some point position himself for a shot at the lightweight championship because he just beat the guy and the version of the guy in Justin Gaethje who had laid out the resume to fight Islam. And I think Topuria's face kind of said it all as well. At the end of that, he was like, he was as surprised as everybody else. His jaw dropped and he may have sold it without even meaning to. So uh, again, oh, anytime you have more than one or two options, that's a good thing. And that's all because of Mr. Max Holloway. You are an interesting case when it comes to somebody who could fight for the BMF belt, because as we've documented on this Anakin Florian podcast, you know, Kenny's a martial artist and a much better human being than me, you know, heaven and hell. He's definitely got the clearer path to heaven than me. Um, but, you know, he's not like Khalil Roundtree Jr. when it comes to octagon restraint either. You know, this is a guy in Kenny Florian who gave Joe Lowe's on a couple of extra shots. And, uh, you know, so. I, I kind of lost my train of thought, but like for you, no, it's baddest motherfucker, right? For you on this podcast, you're like the nicer guy, right? Like I will evil twin me, whatever. Like, but stylistically, I think you're a BMF type of guy, but I think maybe you even were too nice outside the octagon to have fought for that BMF belt. What do you think? Yeah, maybe. I think so. Well, also, 
you know, I didn't have kind of that style of just fighting anyone, anywhere at any time, you know, just right, like, right. I did fight in different weight classes, but yeah. I was definitely more calculated with when I yeah. took the fights. You know, I, I never yeah. said no to a fight, but I just needed the right amount of time. Like, I, right. you know, so uh, I, I don't know if I would qualify for All right. that. All right. yet. So real quickly in about 60 seconds, how would you handicap a fight between Max Holloway and Ilya Topuria at 145 pounds? Okay. I'm still not sure Max is going to be the same guy at 145 pounds. So I would have Toporia as a favorite, probably maybe in the in the minus 150 range and maybe Holloway in the plus 125 range. So close-ish, especially after that last performance. But I would think Toporia would still be the slight favorite heading into that one. In terms of the leg kicks that Max Holloway absorbed in this fight against Justin Gaethje, a lot of fighters say this is a toughness equation. Now, we all have different pain thresholds or whatever, right? But like when Cody Garbrandt fought Dominic Cruz, it was this virtuoso performance. Cody could barely walk. As yeah. Dana White acknowledged at the press conference, Max Holloway is wearing super tight jeans, and I see him at the post show, and he's not even limping, right? So what a tough customer. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And do again, you believe in the right spot? Well, like Bilal Muhammad repeatedly says, it's a toughness equation, right? But like Conor McGregor, when he absorbed those leg kicks against Dustin Poirier, like, dude, like, like physiologic, like look, the, the visual. I mean, I don't know that any human being would have been able to walk on that type of injury. So I wouldn't sit here and suggest that, like, I think Conor's tough enough to take leg kicks, but he was in a wheelchair, you know? So like, do you think it's a, a toughness quotient type thing or what? I think it's a toughness uh, quote, uh, you know, definitely in, in that realm uh, as far as having that toughness, but also having the ability to keep your composure so you're not losing any added energy to the equation, right? So I, I think when you grow up in Hawaii and you grow up in the way that Max Holloway did, he's dealt with a ton of adversity, man. And he's had a lot of street fights along the way. That's just kind of the nature of, yeah. you know, living there. And I think, nothing kind of phases him at this state at this stage you know he's seen the worst of it and this was no different and he had a ton of time in that octagon where i don't know he he just brought that composure that calmness and of course that toughness you know the, the dude's something special man yeah congratulations to max blessed holloway on a life changing night and performance and anyone who watches this show regularly knows that his performance against Calvin Cater from January of 2021 on Fight Island on ABC is immortalized behind me. That is the singular greatest performance that I have seen with my own eyes, but that was against Calvin Cater. That was not against a prime Justin Gaethje with championship stakes. And obviously it wasn't punctuated with a highlight like this with one second to go. So I said to Max Holloway after this fight, I can't believe you you topped the Calvin Cater performance because when I hearken back to the best offensive performances I've seen, Kenny Colby Covington against Robbie Lawler, all the records are Holloway versus Cater, and yet somehow he topped it. So congrats to Max Holloway. We'll get Ray Longo's thoughts on that, but uh, what an absolute warrior, and uh, Hawaii couldn't have a better guy to uh, to root for and uh, and get behind. And uh, the same can be said for Danbury, Connecticut's own Alex Padeda, Ken Flo. Uh, <laughs> Sao Paulo, Brazil as well. The UFC light heavyweight champion has done things in two and a half years that most fighters can only dream of. And he does this on the heels of a hall of fame career as a kickboxer. He just got inducted, right? Defended, I think his middleweight championship in glory kickboxing five times. And now he defends the UFC light heavyweight championship successfully. My goodness, Kenny, I truly don't know what else to say about this guy uh, other than he has maximized his utility. He has realized financial freedom, seemingly hardest worker in the room, and it couldn't happen to a better guy. You could put him in a tuxedo and, and have one of those, you know, long cigarettes, and you could put him in some classy pit place, and you look at Al Alex Pereira's face, and you know that he enjoys hurting people. He just has that look. And, you know, you go back to the press conference with, where Dana White is announcing that, Yes, in fact, he will give everybody $300,000 bonuses. And every single person on that stage was cheering, was excited, was animated. And then there was Alex Pereira with just a stone-cold huh. face look 
no reaction whatsoever, probably still thinking about punching Jamal Hill in the face. And he's just different. Everything about him, you know, the way that he thinks, the way that he approaches the game, the way that he fights, the power that he brings, the speed that he brings, the dude is unusual. I mean, let's talk about the ending of that fight. Please. Gets kicked in the cup. Referee goes in to stop the accident. No, 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 no. I got this. I got this. I got this. Just waves him off, walks forward, murders another dude with a left hand. He drops. He finishes him, puts him to sleep, and then goes like this with his hands like he's presenting a Thanksgiving dinner. Like, here it is. It's on the table. Look what I did. Here's my creation. This is what I do best in the world. Yeah. Um, the, the dude is unusual, just crazy, crazy power and structure. The, the man is special, just like Holloway. And again, this is this was the, the cherry on top, right? I mean, unbelievable. Jamal Hill's a very dangerous dude. Yeah. But the yeah. aura that Pereira yeah. brings, he just took over, took over yeah. the fight. And you know what else is crazy? Not for nothing else, since we're on the fucking DraftKings network. That Alex Pade to minus 125 money line, right? Dude. When you looked at all the factors, the active competition schedule, the lack of a major injury, yeah. all the big time title fights that Alex Pade competed in, and then just the the different nature of his life and career as a striker. Like, I think Jamal Hill, if his life has played out differently, you know, could have been a really high level shooting guard, not to sit here and suggest NBA, right? Yeah. But, you know, there are a lot of factors in Alex Pedeta's favor. And when you look at that gesture at the end of the fight, his inner monologue is like, is that all you got, man? You know, like as if to say there are levels to this game. Like yeah. this one thing that you want to try to do, if you're Steve Ursig on May 4th against Alessandre Pantoja, lay some sort of foundation. For a rematch with Pantoja, even if you don't win the fight, and I'm not at all being suggestive of Steve Ursag not being able to win that fight, right? But go to war with the guy. Establish yourself as an undeniable bona fide flyweight elite. And I believe Jamal Hill's a light heavyweight elite, right? But Alex Pade would be minus 600 for the rematch at this point in time, right? So it's going to be a rebuild for Jamal Hill, and we didn't hit on what's next for Justin Gaethje. Time permitting, we will. Um, but, dude, Alex Pededa is the real deal, and his game has been called simple, which is fine. But, you know, best of luck to the rest of the light heavyweight division. We all love Magomed Ankalaev and his game and his wrestling and his versatility. You know, all the best against that Poetan cat. No question about it, dude. But, like, for anyone who's operating at a high level, right, like yourself for broadcasting, and anyone, no matter what you're doing, it's always about the fundamentals and hard work that you put into it. It's all the things that people don't see. You're doing all the things that a lot of other people don't want to do. Throwing a left hook a million times and analyzing your structure, analyzing your training, going back and doing the basics until you're sick of the basics and then doing it again. Like all those years of kickboxing and Muay Thai and boxing and all like this dude is is unbelievable. And he knows he has that weapon now and he's patient with it. Like just the way he was walking in that cage you knew something violent was going to happen and it was going to be Pereira di- like doling it out. Like the way that he was just walking Jamil, Jam- uh, Jamal Hill down, like it just his energy. He just has that aura of an absolute juggernaut and um, Hill just wasn't able to stop him. It was uh, extremely impressive. And for Pereira to do it in that spot, he just made himself into a, a, an even bigger star. Conor McGregor made his UFC debut April 2013. Ken Flo was there. I actually was expecting a child. Not me. I mean, I was the dad. But uh, he became a two-division champion November 2016. Alex Pedeta made his UFC debut November 2021. Becomes a two-division champion, I believe, November 2023. Now he has successfully defended the light heavyweight title. And we will get get to what is next for the great Alex Pereira here in about 60 seconds. But if you like basketball, the 82 game preseason is now in the books. It's finally time for the real season. Don't miss out on any of the NBA playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA from the play in tournament through the finals. DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same game parlays, live betting odds, boosts, and so much more. Now as Ken Flo and I know the Boston Celtics right now, prohibitive favorites to win it all. That makes me nervous, but these early play in games, unbelievable on paper Pelicans minus one host in the Lakers heat in the Sixers. This is the time of year I love to bet the NBA, and you can too. I mean, the UFC's got the week off, so why not? Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. 
Use code AFPOD. New customers bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets instantly. That's code AFPOD only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. In New York, call 8778-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus. Age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash bball for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. All right, we will go three wide now as we yeah. welcome the star of the program, the Ray Longo Minute. Oh, yeah. In Vegas with a win. How are we doing, buddy? Let me tell you something. It's always better traveling back with a W than an L. Right. That's all I got to say. Right. That's my. All right. Well, uh, we have a lot to get into. How well, much time a, do you have? What much is the you next want. obligation on your schedule today? This is it. You really have like 45 minutes for me? Yeah, 100%, 100%. Okay. All right. Congratulations, my man. Sincerely. Right. Much. I'm not sure the featherweight debut could have gone a whole lot better. And. There's a Calvin Cater side to this, and certainly I think he looked a little bit listless at times, but Aljamain Sterling at 145 pounds I think is a really intriguing addition to this division. You had to be absolutely thrilled. I mean, the danger factor was almost non-existent from moment one. I've, I've never seen I've never seen Cater neutralized like that. Hey, listen, from my standpoint, when the danger is limited like that, I'm always happy because you know I worry about my guys. Obviously, I want the win. I want them to perform well. But at the end of the day, I want them to be healthy and, you know, live a great life. And, man, what a way to shut somebody down. I mean, there's the guy that's fought who? Chikazi, Arnold Allen, uh, Ige, Max. Uh, uh, Max Holloway. I mean, think yeah. of the guys he's fought, all right? I mean, all strikers, but then again, you know, and he always had decent takedown defense. So, I mean, I got to give it up to Aljo, man. I thought he did great. I don't think Aljo was happy with the performance. I have no fucking idea why I went through it with really? him. I thought it, I thought it was absolutely beautiful. Uh, and, uh, you know, look, he landed some – he landed on his feet. You know, he did great on the ground. He had great control. Uh, you know, you know, maybe coming off that last loss and moving up to 45. You know, look, he was uh, – I think he was, you know, he was feeling the nerves a little bit, but it could have been the event because I got to tell you, I was feeling the nerves. I mean, I, that event was by far the best event, Kenny, I was ever at in my life. Like from the press conference to the ceremonial weigh-ins to just the, you know, I, I, like I called the guy up to get on the bus like because they were picking Aljo up at the house. So the guy goes, hey, you could go with 3.30, 4.30. But I said, yeah, I'll probably go with 4.30. And then I guess the show started. I hear Anik and Rogan's voice, and, uh, and I, 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 I just get my shit on. I go to the. There was nobody even there. They took me over by myself. Like I got to get there. Like I was starting yeah. to wig out. Like and I was chilling. Like I'll go get something to eat. No, fuck that. Yeah. I had to be in that fucking arena. I've never felt like that before. I think they did a great job. Dana crushed absolutely crushed the uh, press conference. I mean, not like we know he couldn't do it, but he knows how to control the crowd. He knows how to give in when he has to give in. He knows when to push back. I thought the guy was absolutely fantastic. And the ambiance, Kenny, in that press conference, when he announced the 300,000, Mark Coleman huh, putting huh. the belt on was crazy. It was absolutely, huh. for, the, for me, like nothing. I, no, I don't think anything gets to me. Like I'm going over to the press conference with Alger going, what a crock of shit, 25 guys, 26 guys on the thing. Who's going to – nobody – what are we doing? Like, it was, And then I get there, and they line up all the champions that were on the card, and I'm starting to go, holy shit, man, I'm, I'm just in la-la land. This, is, this yeah. is huge. And then I started getting, like, into it, and I go, from that moment on, that whole event took on a different uh, – a different turn for me. That says a lot because Ray's been going to UFC fights since 1945. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that really yes. – that's, that's all... and, and, Kenny, that's a compliment. Thank you. I think Because I think it was actually 39. <laughs> <laughs> but I no, – no, Ray. But these are the things you, you can't really – no, unless you're there, you're present, you're feeling the Without energy it, of the crowd, right? It's I, I I wasn't feeling it before that. That's all I'm saying is they right. did such yeah. a great job that they brought out that that emotion that you know, like again, when you've been around for a long time, it just becomes matter of factly. Yeah, right. I was right. I was really beautifully surprised what a 
what a what a great job. Yeah, yeah this curmudgeonly New Yorker who forgot to get his haircut before UFC 300. I see him <laughs> Thursday night at the Virgin Hotel. Shout out to Big Ron. We're in the penthouse. Big Ron. And thanks baby. to Ray for coming by, you know, and making yeah. the effort to come by with Chris Weidman. But yeah, I see this guy Thursday night, you know. And, you know, his pants are wet because of the press conference. I'm like, what's going on here? You know, yeah. I mean, this guy's usually. No, that, you know, I, I actually pissed on my pants, but thanks. For <laughs> yeah. for uh, but no, that's great. And we probably should have led with big picture UFC 300 stuff with you, but it was great to see you. And, uh, yeah. you know, this guy shows up at our appearance with Cuervo as well. I mean, what a soldier you are, you know, I mean, man. You know, Weidman was there. I haven't talked to him since the fight. So we got to see. I mean, I just, I, I don't know. I, I wish I could have stayed for the Cuervo thing. I really did. We had the team dinner, but it looked yeah. like the ambiance was great there, too. It was great seeing Kenny. Yeah. Uh, Kenny getting his due, getting his accolades that he well deserves. Exactly. And, and I love it. And, John, you're always a, a big star with everybody. But it was just great. Everybody's accessible to the people. That's the type of people I like to be around. Yeah. All right. Well, before we potentially circle back to Aljo, one of two winning fighters to get booed at UFC 300. No, I'm just kidding. I got to get to you a little bit. Hey, listen. (laughs) No, come on. He's not. not, uh, That's not unusual. I'm just kidding. I love him. Huh? Well, he's not, that's not a new thing for him. To no, get of food, course not. So. No. And he, no, I did, you know, I just DC wondered aloud during one of these fights. Like, I just don't understand how mixed martial arts as a sport, you know, and we're not going to talk about this today, but how yeah. does mixed martial arts get booed as a sport when wrestling grappling is a part of it? Like when the fight transitions to one part of the sport, you know, it's just interesting. Like it, to it see if crazy. NBA athletes got booed for making layups instead of three pointers or something. It's just, weird. Hey, I, I right. think my biggest advice to him, John, in between uh, whichever round it was, don't fucking listen to this crowd, man. Do not let them become a factor in this goddamn fight. You are doing unreal. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. All and right. he learned his lesson in that last fight against O'Malley. I don't think Without he really it. needed a pressure. I think he was rushing himself and then, you know, got caught with that shot. But the thing for me, Ray, I think, which I probably saw incorrectly, I saw an Aljamain Sterling that had way more pep in his step. He had way more strength and was timing things really well. And I think there were some question marks on my part of going, can his strength translate to 145 pounds? And that was not a problem. I didn't see that really being a problem at all. He's that strong. And then as far as the energy that he brought, this is a much better, I think he was probably showing maybe 75% of what he actually had in 35 and obviously still doing extremely well being a champion who defended the belt. But I think we're going to see a a much better Aljo now at 145. I think, I think he at least proved that and is on that right foot. Well, now he knows what he can do up a weight class. And, and Kenny Calvin's a big dude. He's a yeah. big forty. Yeah. He's a one big. big ones. He's yeah. a big forty-five. A man. That was a concern, uh, and he, he Aljo, didn't have a problem in the strength department. Listen, Aljo's skill set and his set of attributes. If he ever decides to really use them, and he, you know, he he knows right. how to fight within himself. But you see, like those spin back kicks that uh, Holloway was landing on Gaethje. Yeah. Uh, you got to trust me on this he could do that blindfolded. Like I see him do it. And then, you know, like, and I'll always tell him, you know, obviously I'm the striking guy. So, you know, I put my two cents in with that stuff, but that's easy for him. Easy. And he might tell you differently. I'm telling you that from watching what I, and he's got so many other tools that he hasn't really shown yet that, you know, it's going to come a point in time. He's going to let everything go completely. I think on, on that end, the grappling he's got down to a science. He's well, very there might technical. be a matchup that necessitates that he use those things at some point in time, especially up 10 pounds. Right. Yeah. You without know? a doubt. Yeah. Certainly we've always known he's a flashy decorated yeah. dynamic striker, but yes. uh, it's one thing to do it, you know, in one setting and another without guys, it, we're not talking about we're live right now. We're not talking about, you want to talk about Anthony Delemi right now, or can I get back? Yeah. To fucking Max no, let's, 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 right. let's give a shout out right. to Anthony Delemi. Great. No, win for later. Him. no, I said, oh, no, later? no, no, I said later. Yeah. We're oh, not doing that. You do it real quick right now. I didn't get back to Max. No, no, we'll go back later. no you're not going to rush Anthony Delemi. We'll go All back right. to him. Go, go, move on. Let's know. go. We'll get to fucking Are Delemi you later. Kid me with this thing. So, so, Charlie Moynihan, one of my dear friends, longtime ESPN producer. He's been producing for ESPN 25, 30 years, if not longer. I'm not trying to date the guy. But I come up to do the post-fight show with Teddy Atlas and Brett Okamoto, and Charlie says to me, and this guy has covered it all, NBA Finals, Super Bowl for years. He go, After the Holloway thing, he says, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen, right? When you parlay all the factors, the BMF title fight, the title, the fight itself, 
the knockout with one second to go, the UFC 300 angle, right? So whether or not you believe this to be the greatest knockout in UFC history, alongside Anderson Silva, Vitor Belfort, Conor McGregor versus Jose Aldo, Leon Edwards versus Kamar Usman, right? Ray, a lot of people are, are saying as UFC fans, combat sports fans, this is the fucking greatest thing they have ever seen. So I asked the poll question at Anna Florian Pod, like, is this the greatest thing you've ever seen? And yes, there will be some recency bias in there. But I'm just saying, you know, 70% of, you know, five or 10,000 people believe that what we saw Saturday night was the greatest fucking thing they've ever, th ever seen. So where does it stack up for you? It stacks up as probably the greatest thing I've ever seen. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why. Because the guy's ahead in the fight. He's got nothing to gain except getting knocked out by a guy that has the ability to put you out with one punch. And at, with 10 seconds to go, he plants his flag in the middle of the octagon. And let's fucking go. And he knocks him out with two seconds to go. That's some Hollywood shit that you wouldn't even believe. If they put in a move, you'd go, yeah, that, that, that'll fucking happen. Right? <laughs> But Holloway, this is why the guy, look, he didn't have to do that. This guy's a fucking fighter, man. This is what the UFC wants. Who could blame him? That was absolutely phenomenal against a guy that's considered an absolute killer. Let's fucking go. He moved up in weight. Look at all the factors that make it the, the greatest knockout ever. He's a 45, a moving up. Gaethje's an absolute assassin who put his body on the line for anything. Up in the fight, nothing to gain, except he has the ability, the chance to get knocked out. And look what he does. Look what that. You no risk, no reward, no guts, no glory, whatever fucking saying yeah. you want. This is the guy. Holloway is the fucking man, and he's gonna remain the man. And that just guaranteed him a title shot at Tuporia for 100 percent I'm sure yep. of that. That's what, that's, that's I, I don't know what else to say. Like yeah. all those other knockouts came within the fight, yeah. same weight class, you know, nothing. Some good company behind, not but nothing like this where uh, it just the, it was the timing, the pacing, like anything else, like a movie, like a stand up comedy set. Yeah, his pacing and the timing of everything was absolutely beautiful, and he pulled it off. Yeah, it would have been good if not if he didn't knock him out, it still would have been good, right? Right, it would have been, but he knocked, I, I knocked him flat. Face what, may be, what may be more impressive than that knockout in the last second of that round, round five, is the fact that Holloway doesn't need a well wheelbarrow to carry around his balls all day. I yeah. mean, like, like that was that was what got was <laughs> yes. about. Like it was just all right, all right. I beat you as a fighter. Technically, I took you apart. Now let's see whose balls are bigger. And then he just stood yeah. there and you know and gaped I, you on his face with a knock. It was just crazy. Ken, Kenny, I don't think a wheelbarrow's big enough for those balls. <laughs> yeah, and, right. And again. One of the most personable, nicest guys you're going to meet. So, really is. How could you just put everything together? How accessible he is, how compliment. I mean, I saw him. I mean, it feels like I know the guy for 100 years. I don't fail. Yeah, I really don't. I just love watching him fight. Just a great dude, man. A Couldn't be happier man. for a guy. Yeah. And, uh, and Gaethje's always a warrior. It's not taking one ounce of anything away from him. Yeah. Uh, takes two to tango and he's willing to put his his balls on the line too so give them both wheelbarrows so we've been going live for 45 minutes and i wonder aloud how we're going to get to diego lopez in the Ooh. next 75 minutes because there's so many different things that we actually have to get to and kayla harrison by the way ken flo and greg jackson it was nice to see greg jackson there in uh Las Vegas. I'm going to start hanging out with older men like Ray Longo and Kenny Florian and Greg Jackson. <laughs> so I'm not always the oldest man in the room, but what great wow. to see the wizard, Kenny, Greg Jackson. Did you guys break bread or do you guys we, not want that revealed? You guys fucking these dangerous men probably don't. Yeah, want no, revealed. we did. We, 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 we got some dinner. Uh, always great to see Greg, uh, you know, awesome dude, ton of experience. Obviously it's always cool to kind of pick his brain and, um, yeah, man, legend of the game for sure. Uh, how, how old is Craig now? Greg's his name. You call him Craig? <laughs> Greg, I don't know how old Greg is. Gregory. How old be... is Gregory? I don't know. Is a ri rival of yours? You're calling him fucking Craig? No, no. I had a good chat with Winkle John. Oh, I, right. just, I, I didn't know Winkle John's 61. Oh, wait, first, I'll give oh, you. Wow, first, he looks we'll, great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll give you a, a good story because I love it. What are you doing? I'm wearing your Ray Longo Minute t-shirt right now. JohnAnik.com, promo code oh, one I more thought, sleep. Oh, sorry, I thought it was the end. See that? I wore, I'm wearing your fucking face. Right, I mean, I'm first big off, Ron I, Pellegrino wearing your fucking face to our I appearance. I wore you know? all, all Anakin Florian shit the whole week. 
because I'm uh, a yeah. team fucking player. That's right. You saw. Hey, it. I think you wear it because it's comfortable. If I'm being honest, right? I mean, <laughs> you're not. Well, be on on this because I wear it to represent. Because oh, I love well, you thank guys. You. Well, we love you uh, too. Listen, I'm talking. Uh, first off, short, shout out to Sean Shelby. I always like busting his balls, but I love the guy now because we're talking about something. He goes, "Well, we're the same age." I go, "Really?" I go, "How?" I go, "How old are you?" He goes, "52." I go, "Wait a minute. Do you think I'm 52?" <laughs> and then well, I you tell him, I'm, "I tell him I'm 65, going to be 66." He goes, "No fucking way." So I feel fucking great, man. I love hearing those compliments. Well, dude. He, Come on, I mean, man. Let's Big fucking Ron, go. Big Ron is straight as an arrow, but man, he was talking about the Ray Longo aesthetic when you were 30 as if like you were his dream man in that uh, type of scenario. I mean, we all know at a go. point in time uh, when Ray Longo was uh, was shredded up with those blue eyes, it was just uh, like, I mean, you know, I men, know, I mean, you know, women love him, men want to be him, all that stuff. Right? <laughs> I don't know about shredded up at the blue eyes, but yeah. like <laughs> but no, I, you do. Uh, I, you have aged gracefully. I mean, black don't crack, and you're white, but largely for a Caucasian man, you've aged gracefully. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so there are so many directions in which yeah. we could go. There really are. Would you like to talk about Alex Pereira for a minute? Let's go, man. Everything. Bro. There's a lot to talk about. So I don't know that there's a comp for this guy. We have marveled at Israel Adesanya and Conor McGregor and how quickly they essentially laid out Hall of Fame resumes in the UFC. But for this guy to make a decision, right, to transition fully from kickboxing to MMA when he did because he didn't like Izzy sort of talking about him, right? Former alcoholic. Uh, doing this really in a lot of respects for respect, but for financial gain to support his two boys. And he has in a few years become one of the most sensational accomplished MMA fighters of all time. Like at least on paper. Yeah. Look, first, first off, besides even what he's doing in the, in the octagon unequivocally, the best and most scariest walkout I've ever seen in the last 30 years. I mean, who cannot love that man? And, and I don't know if he does it on purpose, but he plays the part. He just has that blank look. This guy looks like, you know, they can announce him from parts unknown and you would <laughs> believe it. You know what I mean? Like I, I just the way he carries himself. That's a scary motherfucker, man. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. That's a scary motherfucker. And he hits like a goddamn freight train. Holy shit. He generates power. I think his, I think it's got to be his, his, the way his arms are so long and the way he could generate power from a short distance is just absolutely phenomenal. So we asked a poll question, who would be next for Alex Pedeta? Now, I said on the broadcast, Kenny, repeatedly as he was getting his Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt for this knockout, he was looking at his left pinky toe, seemed like maybe something was going on that was irritating him, and then... I was told as the broadcast went on in my ear that maybe there was something with his foot. So it sounds to me like May 4th, UFC 301, that does already have a headliner and branding, uh, would be ambitious for this guy. He's not going to fight in defense of his light heavyweight title in a few weeks and cut all the weight again. So it would be a heavyweight fight. And I don't know that you're going to rush Tom Aspinall and Alex Pedeta for UFC 301. Maybe Pedeta positions himself for some heavyweight work this summer against Tom Aspinall. But... I asked the poll question, and I'm not sure why Aspinall and Ankalaev are linked in those percentages, Cody. So if you could get me different results. But essentially the guys who could possibly be next for Alex Pedeta. Tom Aspinall for the interim heavyweight championship. Magomed Ankalaev would seem to be the guy at light heavyweight. Yuri Prohaska had a huge result here, Ken Flo, against Alexander Rakic. But I got to think at light heavyweight, Ankalaev would have the inside lane over Prohaska, perhaps not. Um, but Kenny, what do you think about as to what is next for uh the multi-optional Alex Pereira. You know, if I'm Al, Al, Alex Pereira, I, I would prefer to stay in my weight class. Um, you know, especially the, the stylistic matchup against someone like Aspinall who can put him on his back and keep him there with the size and the weight. Pereira's a big guy, no question about it, but Aspinall is both a tall and wide guy. And uh, weight at the end of the day really does make a difference, especially in a lot of those grappling exchanges. Um, striking wise, Hey, he can knock out anybody all the way up to heavyweight. I, I truly believe that. 100%. Um, but I think at this stage of the game, um, I would like to see him against someone like an Ankalaev. Let's see a new challenger out there. Uh, while Prohaska is always going to make it a very exciting fight. I didn't see anything in his game where I'm like, yes, he's dangerous, but 
I don't think he can prevent Pereira from knocking him out. Like as many times as he got hit against Rockage, I would say Pereira would need to throw one tenth of the amount of those strikes to put Prohaska back to sleep again. So I would like to see him against Ankalaev. Ray, 38% of people said Tom Aspinall is the guy they want to see next for, for Alex Pedeta. 38% also said Magomed Ankalaev. So fan opinion, pretty split there. 18% Yuri Prohaska, 6% other. What would you do with Alex Pedeta? I mean, you got to measure your goals against his, but what do you think they'll do and what would you do? Uh, I, th I think, look, the way his trajectory is, I mean, before we even get that, talk about moments at UFC 300 because I'm thinking about Alex now. A guy gets kicked in the balls and he just, Hey, they're only uh -huh. fuck. They're only balls. Get the fuck away from me! I I got something to do. Wait, you think I'm one of those pussies that gets kicked in the balls? I'm gonna take five minutes. Get the fuck out! And he goes in and does this. I tell you, these are moments, dude. That this event had some shit that's gonna live on forever. And I I I just want to give credit to that too because I'm blown away by that. Didn't even look. Didn't even turn his head. Wouldn't take his eyes off his opponent because. That's not what guys like that do, man. Even when he backs up out of the stare down, he ain't turning around and running back to the corner. He's he's making eye contact as he's walking back. This guy is so fucking dialed in. I love it. Listen uh, to this quote about it. I was starting yeah. to find my distance. I started using leg kicks from the beginning so I could find his distance. He's a southpaw, so it's a little harder. My game plan was to start throwing hands after that. So then he threw the groin shot, but it did not really hurt too much. So I chose to just keep pushing so I did not have to reset the distance, capitalize on the moment. Like, fight IQ, fighting a bunch of championship fights in a row against a guy who tore his Achilles. I'm not trying to, like, lean too much into the Achilles, right? But look at what Alex Pedeta is doing, ladies and gentlemen, you know, and think really seriously before you go bet against him in his next fight. Like, he's he's all in right now. In the middle of his fighting prime, he's getting better every fight. Yeah, and, and to, to your point about what, the, what do you do with him, Look, if he wants to go to heavyweight, I think what he's been doing is absolutely phenomenal. Why not try to complete the uh, the hat trick, man? Let him go up a weight class and do something big or at least give him the opportunity. I 100% think he deserves it, and I think the crowd would want it. I think the fans, you know, obviously are behind him. He's building this aura that's invincible, and give give him that do, man. I, I yeah. say go for it. Yeah, yeah, really run with it because now's the time to do it. It's not going to be there forever. You know, Kenny is a very covert operator, so we don't even know his inner circle necessarily. You know, the next thing you know, he and Greg Jackson are, you know, looking to make sure there's no imminent threat at the bar, and then we don't see Ken Flo again the rest of the week, you know? Wow. Um, but like in terms ninja. of surrounding yourself with good people and being some sort of byproduct of the people that you perpetually surround yourself with, Plenio Cruz, Glover Teixeira, this Alex Pereira corner and circle is really tight for Nelly Feliz, everybody else, and uh, they did a really good job with him, and uh, he might just be getting started here in terms started in terms of what he's going to accomplish in the next four to five years. Uh, Ray, you want to go? Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, John, you could see the friendship there, right? You could yeah. see that they have a good time, bust them balls, they like each other. Not a big camp. They're coming out of Danbury, Connecticut. I don't think yeah. there's another gym up there. Right. I mean, come on, man. I mean, this is like this, you guys, you know, all yeah. tight knit, you know, oh, local, you know, no nonsense. <laughs> fucking yeah. Uh, I don't know how tight knit we are anymore, but we we were tight. But that's what I'm saying. I love that type of scenario where these guys are friends and yeah, you know, just nothing's coming before that. And they're fucking it knocking it out of the park. Yeah, they're knocking the cover off the ball. And you have to love it. Have all to right. love it. Yeah, and, and I also think that from a from a promoter's perspective, as far as Pereira, yeah, when you have a star like that, a guy who's doing so well in his division, I, I think you have to be careful to not push him into the heavyweight division and then maybe diminish that kind of luster potentially. You know, I think you kind of want to keep him, get the most out of him in that weight class, and then maybe do that later. Not to say he can't he, he can, but you gotta start keep building that star. The dude, the dude's doing unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that from a long term standpoint, but from yeah. running off the emotion and the, the 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 momentum you have now, look, the only way it's going to be a disaster is with the grappling, right? Like you say, he could yeah. strike with anybody, so they could definitely pick a guy up there that could be tailor made for him to get a, a heavyweight witness. Absolutely, no question about that. Yeah. But from a from a uh, a building standpoint, you're 100% right. From a seizing the moment standpoint and cashing in on a big payday, I say strike while the iron's hot. This is the time to go. And, like, again, 
it could backfire, but you know, he wanted to take care of his two kids. That'll be well taken care of. They'll be well taken care of. So I, I, I don't ever want to deny a guy of a payday. Kenny Boston Celtics head coach, Joe Missoula shows up to the morning shoot around today. wearing a Zhang Wei Lee t-shirt. No way. Yeah. That's crazy. Talk to me about Zhang Wei Lee over Yan Shaunan. Unanimous decision, 49, 45 times three. And let me just say off the top, really tactical fun fight. A lot of admiration for both corners, but particularly to Uriah Faber and Danny Castillo. They've done tremendous work. Marcus Reeves as well with Jan Shaunan and just loved watching them sort of coach her through a lot of uh, the perilous moments of that fight. Experience yeah, matters. Yeah. And Jan Shaunan, every time I've seen her compete, she's looked better. And I thought she not only technically looked better, but we found out just how willing she is to go to those dark places, man. She is an absolute beast. You are not going to beat her unless she was 100% asleep, whether it was a knockout or a choke. We found out if she's just 50% asleep or even 80% asleep, she was going to find a way to get back to that stool, and she did just that. So toughness, technique, you know, had the right tactic, just didn't have enough against Zhang Wei Li, who, you know, from an athleticism athleticism perspective from a skills perspective just had a little bit too much particularly on the ground i think where she was getting caught up is yan was able to time her because zhang wei li was throwing like little to no feints at all so you can at least see her coming in and yes she's fast but yan Xiaonan is also very fast and was catching her on the counter a few times was the longer taller fighter so she was kind of able to see her enter she was landing the right shot so uh for zhang wei li i'd like to see her faint a little bit more but still her ability to get you on the floor and now look like a wrestler and look like a jiu-jitsu uh fighter it is really impressive How, the, like the strides that she has made from her first fight to where she's at now is really really impressive but uh, I thought that was a very exciting fight. Um, you know, coming off of what the, the Gaethje and Holloway fight after that, you're like, oh my God, I don't know how much more I can handle. You know, this is a lot. And then these guys deliver. And then the fight after that delivered. So it was exhausting, not only because it was late at night, but just the amount of energy watching these guys go at it, the amount of skill that was being exchanged. The, every fight just really delivered. And this was certainly one of them. Right. Yeah. I was super, super impressed. And again, it had it had the moments again where the girls basically choked out. Like again, that part was a weird scenario because she was basically out. So and I'm not I don't want to be a dipshit, but like it was like Marab and Ricky Simone. They overturned that that decision because of that. Marab survived. It right. was the same, same exact thing. That girl was out. Right. The girl was out. Why why wasn't the fight over? She was actually more out than Marab. And even though I thought Jason Herzog handled things beautifully, he, uh, I, I don't guy. know if he's allowed to touch her, he, but nobody else can, you know, yeah. but man, she, by the skin of her teeth, she was able to extend that fight, but you're right. But you know what I mean? And I, and again, I'm going to say that fight was closer than the scorecards indicated because of the knockdowns. You know what I mean? She did knock it down. She just got, she just got hammered with the grappling exchanges and she couldn't get back to her feet. But, but that fight, because of those knockdowns, added a lot of intrigue and, you know, uh, just a great, great visual for anybody watching. So you had to score the fight for, yeah. you know, Whaley, but that fight was really, really close, and it could have turned at any second while that fight was standing up, and it almost did. So hats off to uh, both corners. Uh, I thought they did a great job. Rudy. Thank oh, God he, outstanding thank, job thank, by Rudy. Thank God he had a glove on when he stuck his finger up in those because that would have ah. been kind of – Well, it's actually been, right – yeah, right at the base of the uh, – in yeah. between the two nostrils, Ken. Oh, no, no. Push he, on no, there, he, open up the was, uh, passageway. No, he was knuckle deep, John, if you really look oh, at okay. it. okay. No, he, right. he, he, he took one for the team, Rudy. He's a good man. Very All good right. man. Very I thought you just man. pushed like, right under man. here as he came to the broadcast yeah. booth to tell us, but – uh yeah. Wow. Well, uh, hey, as I was mentioning early, though, you if you can't get the belt, you know, maybe you lay some sort of foundation for a rematch, not to say that they're going to run that one back because of all the strawweight talent. Right. Like, yep. I think at some point, you know, Andrade, I think, has won a couple in a row. You know, she graciously when Jessica Andrade was a champion for a couple cups of coffee, flew to China to fight Zhang Wei Li in her first title defense off of pay-per-view on UFC Fight Pass. So Andrade, say what you want about how she stacks up to the other strawweight contenders right now. She deserves another shot against Zhang Wei Li, period. Don't at me. And by the way, Ray, my favorite word to hear you say in the English language by a significant margin is Hamid. 
Hammered. Oh, it sounds so good. All right, Hammered. so Dustin Poirier is going to fight Islam Makhachev for the undisputed UFC lightweight championship at UFC 302, I believe, on June 1st, Newark, New Jersey, if I'm not mistaken. But Armand Sarukyan's next fight could likely be for the title. Uh, we'll lead with Kenflo on this. Where were you when you're watching Sarukyan and Charles Oliveira? You back at the uh, you back at the Red Rock? Where were you watching this fight, Ray? Uh, I'll tell you where I was. I was uh, in the back, and I didn't really watch it. I had to order it when I got home and rewatch it last night, so right. I got to see it. But podcast will reimburse you. Yep, go yeah. on. Oh, <laughs> I mean, you think that's right? I got to come home and order the goddamn fight. Well, I said that's podcast right. will reimburse. No, no, I, I just said we'll reimburse you. Now it, you're going to complain about no, the, it's not the pay per view on the back it, end. You just it's said, not, and you also said off yes. the top of this Ray Longo minute, you talked about this event. And you've a lot of data. You can't pay the fucking $79.99. No, we got no. the podcast to reimburse you. We got you. I tell you, he's brutal today. He's brutal. <laughs> he's, hammer, uh, he's hammering. He's hammering. Yeah, I get, yeah. I'm getting hammered. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to make another point with that. It's not the podcast is uh, <laughs> place. But uh, wait, where, so where were we? Again? Where we were, were talking so about where you were for that fight. It sounds like maybe I should have asked Kenny, but go ahead. Right I didn't so mean I, to bite your head uh, off. And Ray Longo, incidentally, very generous man. I'm not trying to you know, cast aspersions here yeah. that this is a, a frugal or cheap gentleman not wanting to pay for a generous guy. You should see what he sent my kids. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing ever. Hey, right? you can, <laughs> I'm just you, kidding. Listen, you could you could try you could try passing that around. You're gonna come on deaf ears because I'm a generous <laughs> motherfucker. But anyway, listen. So I think I was in the back, so I saw bits and pieces of it. But when I got home, I saw it. I thought you know, I I picked Saruki into win, and I thought he did a yeah. I thought he did a great job of controlling. You know, uh, Oliver always has trouble with the top pressure. He's still dangerous yeah. off his back, but he can't. You know, you're just not going to win a fight like that. And uh, man, but he had his look. Sarukian's tough, man. That choke was. I mean, you have to give it up to the guy. Survive first and then win, and that's yeah. what he fucking did. And that was not easy to do. You could see he was struggling, Kenny. And I'm saying 99% of the guys would have tapped. He's not one of them, and he deserves to win that fight. And I think that's a really, I I want to see that fight more than any other fight. I want to see Sarukian against uh, Islam. That's the fight I want to see more than any other fight. Ken Flo, Charles Oliveira, Armand Sarukian, talk to me. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. I, I think that's why Sarukian was a favorite. Um, and Oliveira, again, proved that offensively he is a problem. He's a nightmare because of all the tools that he brings offensively. But when he is, uh, you know, the nail and not the hammer, um, that's when he can, that's when he can struggle a little bit defensively. He showed that vulnerability didn't take a, a whole lot of damage, but those short elbows from Saruki on man, he's, he's absolutely brutal there. And again, I think a great measuring stick for that was his fight against Davi Hamos, an ADCC gold medalist, you know, as good as it gets when it comes to grappling. Um, and he was dominant from that top position. He was not afraid to engage on the ground, something that a lot of people are afraid to do against Oliveira, and did so after almost getting submitted off the guillotine, by the way. But he really did a great job of being defensively sound when he needed to be. He was winning the rounds when he needed to, battled back after losing round one, winning rounds two and three, um, and doing it on the ground against Oliveira, you know, um, and, and I think that vulnerability uh, kind of revealed itself again here for Charles Oliveira. Still going to be exciting. I still want to see him fight, yes, you know, yes. um, but uh, he, he came up short because of those same things that uh, he's been kind of showing in, in previous mm -hmm. losses or even when he kind of comes back to win and we see him get dropped with something. But um, he's still really dangerous. I think I saw some improvements in his striking as well. Um, so Oliver is still getting better. Just defensively needs to be a little bit sharper. But Sarukian, man, proved himself uh, to absolutely be worthy of uh, fighting for a belt in the near future. 100%. And I think also, Kenny, he's a guy that you got to put to sleep or you're not yeah. stopping him. Like he's, he's not going to quit. He's not going to tap early. He's got to go out. Light's got to be out completely. Else that guy's going to be a problem. Definitely. Thought, he, thought it was a great fight for him.
Oh, and it's really telling just to hear all the other pro fighters talk about Armand Sarukyan. And uh, Kenny, by the way, some connective tissue for you and me. You hearkened uh, back to the fight between Armand Sarukyan and Davi Hamosh. Mm. So I asked Armand in the fighter meeting any sort of comp from your past or maybe a fight that might, you know, help you with this one. And uh, he mentioned Davi Hamosh. So, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be a confidence uh, builder. And the other thing is... You know, in that fight, I, I would have loved to have seen five rounds, you know, because oh, yeah. it, was still, it wasn't absolutely yes. clear who was going to win that yes. fight if we went into rounds four and five. So right. uh, may, maybe we see that down the line uh, at some point, but just an awesome fight. Very technical. And John, that's pretty good. Hawking back. What'd you watch? Robin Hood before you got on the broadcast? <laughs> Hawking back. I know. Embarrassingly enough, I've dropped that verb twice today. I, <laughs> I regret doing that. It's become a little bit of a verbal crutch on this episode, you know, but yeah, I'm a little bit under yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he. Hawking <laughs> back right. to the uh, All right, sorry. Bobby Ramos fight. <laughs> I, uh, I'm underslept. That was the most exhausting night of my professional career, which is neither I'm here nor like, there. Uh, I, I get that, man. So, but Charles Oliveira, I'd just like to say really quickly, I, I feel like I want to get a, like a Charles Oliveira tattoo. And I'm not sure if he's the most popular, excuse me, fighter in the world right now, but he's certainly in the top three. It's crazy to think that Amanda Nunes upon retirement sort of, said, I want some Brazilian to, you know, take the throne now and become a champion because at the time there were no Brazilian champions, right? Mm -hmm. And Alex Pereira and Charles Oliveira, two of the biggest three stars in the company right now, essentially. And Alessandre Pantoja has also won the belt as well. Maida Bueno Silva was not able to get that done, right? But it's just amazing what Charles Oliveira has become. And even if the loudest ovations on this night were reserved for Alex Pereira, Charles Oliveira has a relationship with this fan base that is uh, on a level that, you know, people can only dream of. Ah, uh, can we get yes. to Bo Nickel, Ray? Let's I got like there. seven more minutes with Ray Longo. What does the rest of your day hold, Ray? By the way, I'm just uh, my day. I cancel all my my private lessons. I'm going into workout, and then I'll teach the uh, the seven o'clock class. Maybe in the future, you don't even book those privates on a Monday following a pay per view when you're when you're crossing yeah. time zones on the way back, right? Not want to inconvenience those people. You might as well just get ahead of it and not book them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. But that's what I yeah. did. I think, but, yeah. but thanks for but thanks for, I don't know, for <laughs> so, nothing. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, it's out for you. Some of those some of those people listen. So if you guys are listening, oh, you know, yeah, just, in the listening. Future, just don't be expected. The Ray's going to show up on those Mondays after a pay per view. Uh, Seems today he prioritized this He's show. He's killing over, your business, yeah. Ray. My goodness, yeah, I could. Not. I just wait. I'm killing is. his business. Is that what you're saying, Kenny? <laughs> All right. I mean, we can take this offline. I feel like we've done some things <laughs> to maybe help your business, you know. Um, <laughs> maybe That's the chicken fair. pound can send me some fucking chicken before the end of time, you know. Wow. Jeez. Yeah, Christ. chicken pound getting a shout out. Yep. Uh, what else Two we shout got? Outs. Oh, Bo, Bo Bo yeah. Let's get to Bo Nickel, shall we? Yes. Cody, maybe you can chase the quote as to what he said Dana White said to him after the fight, but Nickel comes over after the win over Cody Brundage. He was a little bit disappointed. I know he expects perfection, and he did get hit with a right hand early in this fight, but the end comes at 338 of round two by rear naked choke. Bo Nickel 6-0, and realizes a stool for the first time in his MMA career, right? Longest pro fight coming in was two minutes and 54 seconds. Uh, what would you make of Bo Nickel methodically moving forward, kicking off the pay-per-view, Ray Longo? No, a couple of things. First off, the guy got booed at the press conference. For what reason? I have no fucking idea. Maybe they were mad he was on the, the main card. But I, I think more impressive than than the fight for me was the way he handled the microphone. And very articulate, man. I got six goddamn fights. What do you want? We like Give me a chance to grow a little bit. You know what I mean? And guys like that can't get fights on the regional scene. Nobody will fight them. So he's got to do on-the-job training in the biggest show in the world. And I think he's doing an absolutely great job. Do I get the And again, I'm biased and everybody could attack the shit out of me, but do I get the Chris Weidman vibe when Weidman was coming up, you know, he was going in there, like, you know, he was, he was taking people out, you know, the Lawler's, the, you know, Munoz is, was a good wrestler. I mean, he did some stuff coming up and he had no fights. He had five or six fights. How many fights did he have when he fought for the title? So I'm not getting that vibe because I think Weidman had a different type of presence and he wanted everything as quick as possible. But what I love about Bo Nickel is he's taking his time yeah. and I think it's really going to pay off for him. He's super intelligent. I love the way he spoke. Obviously he's, he's talented as a motherfucker, but I think he's got the right thing. He doesn't want to be pushed into anything big. Give him a chance to grow. Cause again, you can't get fights on the regional circuit. 
I'm there. I promote fights. Nobody's fighting a guy like Bo Nickel. And like I think he said, if you get the contract, just sign the goddamn contract because, you know, it is what it is. And let him have a couple of fights, build them up the right way, and I think you're going to see an outstanding champion. So uh, he might have been disappointed with the performance, but I love the way he handled the mic. I think he's got a clear, clear vision of what he wants to do and how he wants to get there. And it sounds perfect to me. So yeah. Weidman, Weidman was a little different, man. He yeah, wanted no, it. I like the he, you know, analogy. And Weidman, you know, you know, Weidman, you know, when John Jones, somebody backed out of that fight, I was on the plane. But when I got off, I had 10 messages. He wanted to fight John Jones. So he was he right. was just right in the mix from the beginning. You know what I mean? And it was a little different. And uh, for Chris, it worked out. But I think this guy's taken a, a more methodical approach, and I, and I love it. I think it's the right thing to do. Yeah, no, that's really valuable stuff there from the uh, the legend, the wise Ray Longo. Kenny Bo Nickel thought he would be 10 or 11 and 0 when he got to the UFC, but certainly hard to find fights. Twice he competed not, on Dana not White Contender Series, no contest. Yeah, and, you know, Kemflo back in the day, two and one, same thing. You know, who's going to fight Kemflo regionally? Kenny actually is like, these local promotions like say no elbows, and Kenny's still fucking throwing elbows. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> eventually just got to get to the UFC, can't find anybody to fight locally. But Kenny, what'd you and, make and, of, uh, hey, go and ahead. Kenny was And Kenny was fighting at 205 and he couldn't get right, fights. Right, I mean, that's right. fucking, cra <laughs> fucking crazy. Unbelievable. Kenny, uh, what'd you make of Bo Nickel? Well, listen, I, I can also relate to you not having a whole lot of experience and then kind of being thrown into the fire. It's like, here you go. You're in the UFC, kid. You got four fights. Good luck. Um, not easy, you know, because you're, you're inevitably going to make some mistakes. Now, if you're able to make some mistakes and still get the wins, these are great things. Bo Nickel didn't have a perfect performance, but it was still damn good. Um, and what, the first time he ever had to go into round two? You're going to learn a lot from that process. Not every fight is going to be perfection. That's not the way real combat goes. You're going to have to some adversity. You're going to make mistakes. How you react to those mistakes, that's when we find out who you are. And, you know, still you can argue he hasn't experienced a whole lot of adversity. We haven't seen him in rounds three, four, five. We haven't we haven't seen him when he's hurt. We haven't seen him when he's tired. We will still find those things out. You can't buy experience, and he's going to be learning as he goes and during, during these fights. But still, I thought it was a really solid performance. For me, I think he wasn't really able to manage um, the energy of the fight a little bit. He, he kind of was just engaging whenever uh, Brundage wanted to engage. Um, and I think it would be one, probably one of those fights where it seems like it was really being played very, like almost in fast forward uh, during the fight. I want to see Bo out there being able to kind of lead the dance, go when he wants, defuse pressure when he wants, as opposed to kind of just being this mad scramble. So I think that's probably more of what I would criticize. But I mean, come on, I'm, I'm still kind of being very picky here. Bo Nickel is yeah. also special, and I expect him to be a champion in the future as well. Yes. There was a lot of pressure on Bo Nickel. We asked last week, is there more pressure on him or Kayla Harrison or Zhang Wei Li? And a lot of that pressure was just rooted in kicking off the pay-per-view. And right. Dana White came over to provide some reassurance and just said, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to be a big star. I just think some of Bo's disappointment was not only his own perfection, but kicking off the biggest show in UFC history. And uh, all those big favorites, Kayla Harrison, Bo Nickel, Zhang Wei Li, were able to uh, hold serve as the favorite. Ray, I'm supposed to let you go right now. No, so, I'm good. All right. So, uh, I mean, do I go Delemi or Prohaska is the well, question. Let's go, I, let's go. First of all, let's talk about Kayla Harrison because I had the opportunity right. to meet her. He's absolutely, like, how about neither? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely love her. This is a great soul of a person. I think she stands for the right stuff. I What a, what a performance she had. Handles the mic beautifully. Give it a title shot. Uh, I believe she yeah. beat Raquel Pelletin. She deserves it. I think she represents, you know, women's MMA beautifully. And like again, I just you know for meeting her for the first time, just felt like a like an East Coast ball busting mentality. I love her, yeah. and I think she deserves the shot. That's the call. Give it and give it a title shot next. She's she's ready for it. She's a professional. When you talk to her, oh yeah, uh, you know what I mean. Like at, on every level, she's exactly what you want in a fighter in a person. And everything. So hats off to Kayla Harrison on a great UFC yeah. debut. And I think Kenny had mentioned something before where she wasn't put on the, there were so many fights. She kind of wasn't the main attraction, which takes a lot of pressure off you, Kenny. I think that's a really good point. Whether it would have bothered her or not, because she's got such great experience, who knows? But yeah, 
those octagon jitters with the UFC, and you're at that press conference. Oh yeah, I, everybody's human. I mean, it could it could really affect you. But she seemed to be totally unaffected. She's dialed in, and uh, she deserves that shot. I'm 100 percent behind her. Always yeah. be a big fan of hers moving forward. I think yeah. she's she's unbelievable. Yeah, she'll be a five to one favorite probably uh, to beat my friend Raquel Pennington uh, if oh, they that, do fight. Is that you your know? buddy? Yeah, well, they're all my friends. I mean, I just got to know Kayla, but I like her as well. But yeah, Raquel and I are close. And uh, I remember being with her after one of her two losses to Holly Holm and uh, just tremendously frustrating. And then she reeled off, you know, five or six in a row to become the world nice. champion thereafter. So, um, but Laura Sanko, my great colleague and friend, said that she feels like Kayla Harrison to the UFC is exactly what women's MMA re- needs right now. And I, I yeah, would agree with that. I, I think Kayla just. Just a breath of so fresh air to the table. And if anybody can speak Kenny to, uh, to, you know, what she has accomplished professionally and dealt with personally, it's you right. Saving her family and adopting these two beautiful children and raising them on her own. Um, just a, a tremendous ambassador for MMA and the UFC. And, uh, she's got a little edge to her as well, right? She moved to Boston when she was 16. I don't know if we can claim her as a uh, Massachusetts natives as, you know, like first, you know, Massachusetts fighter, right? Like when we talk about Ken Flo being the best f- fighter out of Massachusetts, we're not going to like put Kayla in that class, are we, Ken Flo? That's a good thing because she would be the better fighter out of Massachusetts. <laughs> um, you know, listen, I-, I think that she went out there and did Kayla Harrison things. I mean, that's what she does best. She gets a hold of you. She throws you on the ground with something spectacular, and then she beats you up. And we have to remind people that how many people go out and fight Holly home and actually look good? Not a whole lot right. of people. Holly has a knack for making you look bad, even in wins, even if you beat her. It's not one of these things where you can dominate someone like Holly home. Rarely does that happen. Um, and with all that experience, with all that athleticism and size and striking ability, you know, she's going to be a tough matchup for anybody. And this was pretty flawless from Kayla Harrison. Aside from that takedown where Holly was able to get on top, Holly still didn't take advantage of that position. It was Kayla, kept her composure, got right back to her feet, went right back to work, got the takedown, took over. Nasty, nasty grounded pound. I mean, she was strong all the way at 155 pounds, 145 pounds. I can't even imagine what it's like to lock up with Kayla Harrison at 135 pounds. Just the fact that she was able to do that. She was on point from the get-go. I was seeing her slowly lose that weight, cut down. Um, Everything's perfect. The UFC really has a star in Kayla Harrison. Like You just saw it coming. When I was hearing that she was maybe going to go over to the UFC, I was like, this is probably one of the best things they could do for women's MMA. She is going to be huge. She's going to be massive. People still don't know the full story behind her and what she's accomplished. As that story comes out more and more, I I think she's going to resonate that much more with the fans. But she's got the skills to back it up. She's got the pedigree. She's got the story. And she showed the whole world that she has the skills to back it up as well not a whole lot of people can go out there and make holly home look like that yeah and the unknown john was can she make the 35 she's she's jacked that girl so she yeah. made the weight i was on the bus with her, i think be after before whatever she never wavered in her personality you know some people don't want to look at you, they want to talk to you she was upbeat every aspect of that whole whole thing so Again, hats off to hats off to a team. She's got a great corner, Steve Marco, uh, Anderson, uh, Mike Brown's obviously great. Her strength and conditioning coach, I can't think of his name, but I know he consulted my great friend Tony Ricci, was a part of that and helping her make the weight. And Tony had nothing but beautiful things to say about her. So she's surrounded by the right people. She's in the right spot. Like you say, she's got the backstory. She lives it. She speaks it. And she's, you know, you just, when you talk to you, you know, there's, there's something special about this girl. There really is. She's just a, I just say like a beautiful soul. That's what I see. I, I, and I, I don't think I'm mistaken. Like, I don't think she's pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. She's a really sweetheart, this girl. Uh, And I just wish her nothing but the best. She was on my flight back to Miami. Took up a lot of that overhead space, did Kayla Harrison. I'll tell you that. (laughs) All right. So I thought on this night, it was a particularly outstanding night for my broadcast partners, Joe Rogan and Daniel Cormier. And if you could only see Joe 
walk into the dressing room just jumping out of his skin with enthusiasm and excitement. And we were talking about the depth of the card, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but we mentioned Diego Lopez versus Sadiq Youssef, and Joe said he thinks Diego Lopez is going to be a world champion. And then Diego Lopez promptly goes out there, Ken Flo, in a minute and 29 seconds and uh, disposes of Super Sadiq Youssef in a way we have never seen before. Like, I'm not sure where the credit's supposed to be dispersed in terms of like a fucking chai t- pie chart, right? But like Francisco Grasso, man, like what this dude is yeah. developing is unbelievable. Ken Flo, Diego Lopez, man, like this is a BJJ coach, just a five-tool player. I wouldn't be surprised if this guy's in a championship setting in a win or two, man. What a what a rise to start a man. I, it's crazy. Well, this was one of those fights, right? Like every fight you're trying to prove something. But this was one of those fights for me where I go, okay, We're going to find out if he's going to be a title contender. If he's able to beat Yusef, just to get a decision win would be impressive. Like, hey, he's here. People need to watch out. Um, You know, not only did we get that answer, but I think we got the answer that he's now calm inside the octagon. He knows how to manage the energy of a fight as opposed to, say, Bo Nickel. He went out there, was able to take a lot of what Yusef does well away from him. He got into that boxing range. He showed that he shows he could throw the shorter, harder punches in tight. Um, and he never let Yusuf get started. That's what you do against a guy who comes with a very methodical game and likes to plan and strategize from the outside and take his time. Lopez never let him even get into that role. It was really cool to watch. Uh, and for me, uh, you know, this was one of the ones that I got wrong. Um, I'm not surprised by the result, but the way that he did it and as quickly as he did it was surprising. Lopez is the real deal. This is a guy that is a future title contender. No question about that. And I tell you, Lopez has the X factor. Yeah. And you know what that factor is? What's that? His fucking haircut. Because I guarantee you, you cut that fucking hair off. This guy can't win a fight. This this is Samson with that haircut. Yeah. I'm telling you, that haircut is what does it. But no, what a great kid surrounded by great people. We saw him at the, when well, we were all taking the, the photos at the end. Great kid. Again, uh, Grasso, Francisco Grasso, absolutely great job of what he's doing over there. Yeah. All all sweetheart people. And that kid, that kid's coming to fight, man. Oh, I like, my gosh. Even, even his call out of the other guy. Who the hell wants to fight that guy now? It's never right. like an exciting fight. Kenny, don't that's give nuts. Shit. That's right? nuts, too. He's a good Calling this, out. Mavsar yeah. Ivlov, he almost finished him four times in their fight that he took on five days' notice. But dude, you're right, Ray. Like calling for him yeah. again, like you know. And as far as the Bo Nickel comparison, you know, Diego's got five times the amount of fights. As exactly. Bo yeah. So, absolutely. I mean, he should be able to manage the crowd and the energy at this point. Bo Nickel. Yeah. That's again what I love about what he was saying. Give Give me some time. I mean, Jesus, yeah. I, I just got here. What do you, you know, what do you bust right. up my balls well, for? The Diego Lopez story is crazy, right? He competed on the Contender Series, I believe, lost, and then went and lost his next fight, and then obviously it was hard for him to find fights at times, but. Man, yeah. like he went into See this you. weekend not even ranked, so he's going to be ranked right now. You better hope he doesn't come for your guy, Aljamain Sterling, you know? <laughs> the other way to uh, but no, Lopez is going to be a star. I'd I'll like to see him get a fucking main event. I know he only made his UFC debut like a year ago, but he's a bona fide featherweight contender. Selfishly, I just want him to have a main event because I know it's going to end in round one instead of, you know, round five at the end of the night. A little extra recreational time with the Ray Longos of the world, you know? Wow, all right. I like where your head's at. All right, hey, let's so, let's touch on Delemi for a minute before I forget. Please, Anthony Delemi, six and zero, oh, great victory at the uh, CFFC. Look for this kid on the Contender Series this summer. He's a really nice kid, great family. Let's fucking do it. But uh, hats off to Delemi. We all watched the fight during Aljo's uh, ceremonial dinner uh, the night before the fight, and everybody was ecstatic. So good energy. That's awesome. And Ray Longo just managing obligations as usual, right? Team dinner. Unbelievable. Are you wasn't the fight in Vegas or no? No, that fight was in uh the Hard Rock at uh in Jersey. Atlantic City. All right. Yeah. Um all right man, well uh you know, have a great day and a better evening. We exp- we appreciate your extended time. Uh we will uh we will start a GoFundMe for uh your pay-per-views. <laughs> You want me to put the Rolex up there again? Is that what you want? I do. Can you, you do that, the fucking Rolly up there? Hey, listen, Rolex? it was great to finally get to see you guys out in Vegas. I'm glad yes. we all got together. Even though it was only short, Kenny, 
always always great to catch up with you and uh, absolutely uh, like man. again i was glad to see lines of people wanting to take pictures with you guys and <laughs> yeah you guys give back i mean that's what it's all about now what yeah. do we have this platform for to be selfish uh, hey, you want to be a mainly. selfish motherfucker no, 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 no. a little bit huh? a little we bit. give I back little we bit. give back a little bit yeah that's the goal bit. buddy and we actually a were contemplating bit. on sunday trying to figure out a way to sort of fight through the fatigue and get out get something out there because I know people were looking for some content on the day after UFC 300, but we're here live on a Monday. We're going to let you go. So, uh, right. you know, go sweat it out and uh, we will talk to you in about a week, but congratulations to you and Aljamain Sterling. I'm just having a little bit of fun at, at your guys's expense, you know, rumblings oh, yeah. in Massachusetts that cater through the fight, but you know, you guys can celebrate. <laughs> you know? Hey, listen, thank you guys. Thanks for everything. It was a great weekend. Shout out to all the minute men. I mean, the love I got in Vegas this time, I haven't experienced in a long time. So, yeah. uh, I think the crowd, the, the fans, everybody was on point. It just, you know, worlds yeah. collided, whatever that saying is where everything meets at the right point. I think it was just a phenomenal weekend and you guys are the best. Thanks. I'm out of here. There he is. You're the man. We love you. Energy. Great yeah. to see you. Yeah, awesome to see these old guys like Ken Flo and Ray Longo reconnect. You know, I'm just kidding. I'm Ken Flo's <laughs> age, but so uh, he just loves seeing you. And you guys just obviously go way back. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's always cool when we can get everybody together. So uh, thanks to the Virgin Hotel. Thanks to Big Ron Pellegrino. Great to have our producer, Cody Merrow, out there. Jason Anik, the president of the Diego Lopez fan club. This Diego <laughs> Lopez is insane, right? And an even better human being like Francisco Grasso, Alexa Grasso, Diego Lopez, Alessandro Costa. These are elite human beings. And uh, to see them realize the success is what life is uh, is all about. You know what else life is about? A wager every now and again. It's actually finally time for the real season. So don't miss out on any of the NBA playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook. Unofficial sports betting partner of the NBA. From the play-in tournament through the finals, DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered. Same game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and so much more. How about this Western Conference? Absolutely insane. Clippers and Mavericks in the first round. Pick a minus 110 on both sides for that series price. Suns minus 115 against the Minnesota Timberwolves, who come back minus 105. I actually have action on both of those as well as individual games, but not going to tell you what it is right now. Let's go. UFC has the week off. Get on in there. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Not now, but right now. Use code AFPOD. New customers bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets instantly. That's code AFPOD only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in West Virginia. Visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. In New York, 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus, age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario, bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash bball for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. All right, so... Real quickly, Kenny, I'm going to try to be efficient on some of these final fights at UFC 300, and then time permitting, we'll get some thoughts from you on Conor McGregor, Michael Chandler, and potentially even Islam Makhachev against Dustin Poirier, both of which were announced over the weekend, also Sean Strickland, Paolo Costa. So, Aljamain Sterling, we talked about his performance. I just wanted to get your quick thoughts on Calvin Cater because I don't know that there's much fight left in this dog. I mean, he has, you know, been through it to get to it. He has often talked about the journey being the destination. He has realized a lot of success as a promoter. Uh, this was a challenging matchup, but you know, he was completely neutralized and, uh, not to suggest that that wasn't all Aljo's doing, but, uh, I don't know. I kind of felt bad for Cal on this night, a huge showcase for the sport. And, uh, you know, for whatever reason, you know, Tyson Chartier, our friend couldn't get him going. You're on mute. Love you though. Gosh. Uh, yeah, it seemed like, you know, there, there was an issue with his ability to get his striking going. And I think it was kind of twofold. It was the unorthodox approach from Al Jermaine Sterling. Uh, and also I think it was the threat of the takedowns. It seemed to freeze up his striking. Um, and I don't know, in some of those exchanges, like when he was up against the cage, you like to see a certain level of composure, but you also want to see, a certain level of competitiveness. And I'm not sure there was that sense of urgency out of Cater that you, you'd see in other fights. Like, And perhaps that was maybe his lack of willingness to fight. I'm not sure I want to go that far. I don't know him well enough. But 
seemed like in other fights he's had that energy and, and and it just wasn't there against Aljo. Now certainly Aljo's doing a great job of controlling him, especially up against the cage, on the floor, all that stuff. But I, I don't know. It definitely lacked the sense of urgency, I think, uh, that you, you normally see from Calvin Cater. Renato Moicano over Jalen Turner by TKO. The end comes at 411 of round two. Not sure if Jalen Turner was chasing a potential three hundred thousand dollar bonus, which he might have had a better chance to attain with a walk-off style KO. Uh, but the next thing you know, he was on the wrong side of it. And uh, Moicano's the guy who deserves a lot of credit, Kenny. I love watching him grapple and get the fight where he wants to get it. And uh, obviously, he was able to take Jalen Turner out from there. What do you make of Moicano rallying You know, for a victory here in a huge spot at lightweight? Yeah, now, uh, Turner's inexperience is maybe his mental competitive competitive awareness may have lost him this fight. Um, he had Moicano hurt at a certain point. And, you know, you were talking about me following up, you know, maybe if the person's hurt. I don't do that necessarily to be mean, but I do it to make sure I get the result that I want. If you hesitate during a fight, then, man, you could be in trouble. That one second window, which may even be smaller in mixed martial arts, can be taken away from you if you're not applying the pressure on these on the toughest individuals in the world. You have to, if you see a spot, you got to take them out. And Jalen Turner allowed Moicano back into this fight because maybe he felt that the referee should step in there. You're not a referee. You're a fighter. You fight. You don't let the uh, referee go in there and try to dictate what happens. You have to follow up and try to take that guy out. And when someone is very tough like Moicano and dangerous and knows how to time his takedowns, he was able to battle back. He put Turner on his back. He cooked him in round one. And in the second round, was able to really take advantage. Turner was pretty, pretty much exhausted, didn't know what to do, was overwhelmed. He found that opportunity to take him out with ground and pound, and he did just that. Jalen Turner has a lot of talent, but you have to be better with the decisions that you make in the UFC. Those things matter. Yeah. And on a night on which both Yuri Prohaska and Max Holloway asked for an appearance on the Joe Rogan experience, I thought it was great to see Hinato Moicano say that Joe Rogan was going to be his podcast guest today. So hopefully yes. that comes to fruition. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see what they do with Moicano because there's just an undeniable electricity about him. I'm not sure I've ever enjoyed seeing a Brazilian speak English and work a microphone than this guy, Kenny. He really, uh, I don't know, he has multiple lines every post-fight interview that really resonate. I, I can tell you he's extremely popular with the Bitcoin community right now. I'll tell you that, you know, mentioning Austrian economics and Mises and all these things and property rights. I mean, so, you know, just that whole community, they have a favorite fighter in Moicano and there's a lot of Bitcoiners out there. They were just, uh, they couldn't believe what they were hearing in the post-fight interview. But, you know, when you have a guy who has really changed the way he approaches the fight, you heard him that I cannot afford to lose. It means that, I'm going to fight really smart now. I'm going to be exciting when I can, but I'm going to fight smart, get the wins that I need so I can elevate my career and maybe fight for the title at one point. But more than anything else, he's trying to make as much money as possible. That that nickname is there for a reason. He's doing all the right things, and um, he beat a really tough and talented guy in Jalen Turner. What did you make of Bobby Green against Jim Miller? Jim Miller suggested that maybe Bobby Green has a style that doesn't age well. Hmm. I don't know that Bobby Green has lost much of a step at all. And when you look at some of the challenges, Kenny, that he has taken on over the last several years, whether it's Islam Akashev on short notice or Grant Dawson when he was undefeated in a main event, just wicked impressed with the career evolution for Bobby Green, the sustainability, right? And now realizing financial financial success at this stage of his career and, you know, taking care of business like that and battering Jim Miller 30-25 on one of the cards. Like, it's a huge fucking win for the King. Well, I, I think he has a lot of gratitude, you know, for where he's at at this point in his career. The fact that he is able to make a lot of money now fighting in the UFC, being on these huge cards. Um, and, you know, he's kind of fighting without this pressure. He's just kind of enjoying himself. He's enjoying the fights. He's enjoying the fact that he gets to entertain uh, people with what he does best. And I thought this was an excellent performance from him. Um, you know, he had Jim Miller hurt many times during that fight. 
Um, I think it's almost seemed like Jim Miller kind of ran out of his bag of tricks after round one. And Bobby Green understood what the assignment was after that and then really kind of unleashed hell on Jim Miller. The body kicks down the middle, uh, the, the proper range. It never allowed Jim Miller to really do what he does best, which is get to the clinch and hit those takedowns. Bobby Green was keeping him on the outside, was able to see the takedowns coming, was able to stop the takedowns and beat up and battered uh, Jim Miller. Um, you know, something impressive. All right. So last fight I want to touch on, and then I just want to talk some big picture UFC 300 stuff. We'll get to Connor and Chandler and, uh, and then we'll get, we'll let you get back to childcare or whatever it is you do for, with the rest of your day. So Davison Figueredo beats Cody Garbrandt by rear naked choke. I guess I'm just curious, like where you see Davison in this 135 pound division in which they're all chasing Sean O'Malley, because that sounds like a fun competitive fight, even though Davison's going to need a couple more wins. Like, what are your thoughts on on Figueredo as a, a potential future two division champion, having twice already won the flyweight belt and now ascending at thirty five? Rob Font and now Cody Garbrandt in the rearview mirror. Well, I think his position is secure as someone you want to watch because of the skills that he brings in, because of the pedigree, what he's accomplished in the division, and the fact that he's exciting to watch. Um, you know, he's showing that he has multiple ways to win. He can switch things up. He can use strategy to win fights. And I think that was the difference here. The timing of his takedowns, taking advantage of the opportunity on the ground against Cody Garbrandt. And Cody was looking pretty good early on, but I think the takedowns and specifically the threat of the takedowns, similar to maybe the Turner fight or the Cater fight, um, it tends to shut down your striking. If you don't have a lot of confidence with your takedown defense, it can shut down your striking. It can take you off rhythm. And I think that's what Davison started to do to Cody Garbrandt. And we know about maybe some of the mental hiccups that Cody Garbrandt can encounter uh, during fights. You know, sometimes um, he loses some of that um, emotional stability during fights and makes some poor decisions. And, um, you know, Davison had great timing on that entry, was able to take the back of Cody Garbrandt and ended up getting it done. And, you know, Cody's vulnerability has been if he does end up uh, in bad positions on the ground on his back. That's going to you know, be an effect on any fighter. It's going to be tough for any fighter to deal with. But when you have someone as sharp and as experienced as Davison Figueredo, who's been there with tough guys and five-round fights, um, and the fact that he is very durable uh, and pretty emotionally right. stable in the fights, I think that was the difference. And that was a big, big win for him, and I expect him to do big things. Wouldn't be surprised to see him fight for the belt at some point, but there is a big line leading to that belt at 135 pounds right now, dude. All right, a few quick questions on UFC 300 on the way out. Fact or fiction, Zhang Wei Li's next title defense will come against Tatiana Suarez, who has competed at flyweight, but is now, of course, back to 115 pounds. What do we think? I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right. So, Bo Nickel, Hamzat Chimaev. Right now, do you favor Hamzat Chimaev in a matchup with Bo Nickel, Bo Nickel, given the MMA experience? Dream matchup for a lot of fight fans, Bo Nickel, Hamzat Chimaev. But sitting here April 15, 2024, who do you like? I like the matchup for Bo Nickel based on skills, but right now, b because of experience, yeah, I'd, I'd be leaning towards Hamzat right now. In terms of ranking Max Holloway's knockout all time, our good friend Joaquin Buckley, New Mansa against Impa Kassan Ganai. Aesthetically, I'm not sure you have a neater knockout. For me, I would put Edson Barboza against Terry Edom, actually, aesthetically, a, a notch above that. I thought there was like some attack happening on that arena in Rio de Janeiro. But I do think this greatest knockout of all time conversation, Kenny, oftentimes focuses on fights in which there are championship stakes. So I'm going to give you three and you tell me which one does it for you. Leon Edwards against Kamar Usman. I'll give you four. Leon Edwards against Kamar Usman. Conor McGregor against Jose Aldo. Gosh, I could really open this thing up. No, I'll go Leon Edwards against Kamar Usman, Conor McGregor against Jose Aldo, Anderson Silva against Vitor Belfort, Max Holloway against Justin Holloway against Justin. Man, out of all of those, I would probably be leaning towards the Conor McGregor knockout of Jose Aldo. Jose Aldo at the time was, you know, easily recognized as the number one pound for pound fighter on the planet. 
Connor knocked him out in about 13 seconds. Everyone's jaw dropped, the stakes, everything Connor was saying to build up that fight. And the fact that he was able to go out there and actually get it done in that fashion was something absolutely spectacular. Uh, John is just going back uh, to his backup uh, to get sound. But that was one of those moments I think a lot of people are are never going to forget. Um, however, uh, the way it went down with Max Holloway um, really just putting on a clinic against Justin Gaethje and then ultimately getting that knockout by pointing at the canvas and trading with one of the most dangerous guys in that division and putting him out face first into the canvas, that is without a doubt top three, top five knockouts in UFC history. Just unreal. All right, so we're live right now. My studio just went down. We got the backup set up rolling. Can you hear me, Ken Flo? Yes, sir. I mean, this is what we do. So today's show has been so enjoyable that I'm inclined to go live every Monday and Wednesday, which I think would be be very exciting for our listenership to not have to wait for the show later in the day. But, you know, sometimes when you got a brand new studio, you want to use it. But the fancy studio failed me. So we have the backup set up ready to go here live. All right. So last one from me before we get to Connor and Chandler. In terms of you ranking UFC 300 all time. You were with me there on the ESPN set for MMA Live at UFC 100. You have called a lot of big events dating to UFC 83. For me, I'm not sure that any event singularly would top UFC 229, but UFC 300 is close. We were talking off the air. Islam Akashev and Alexander Volkanovsky in Perth, Western Australia felt absolutely enormous. But And I have actually a visual here, UFC 217, right in New York City. The yep. night upon which three belts changed hands, George St. Pierre against Michael Bisping, Rose Namajunas against Yoani and Jacek, TJ Dillashaw against Cody Garbrandt. Um, some people might say UFC 205. For me, it's either UFC 300 or UFC 229. Where does this one rank all time for you? Yeah, I, I would say overall, top to bottom, first fight to the last fight, I would say probably the best of all time. But is it the best main card? Probably not. It's up there. Um, but as far as you know, it being the best main card, probably not. 229 is one of those that really stand out to me. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, overall, it really did deliver, man. There was a lot of hype behind this. Every single fighter fought their ass off, and uh, it, it was an amazing, an amazing bet. All right, Anakin Florian podcast poll question. Now that we know the weight class, 170 pounds, and we know the date, For Michael Chandler versus Conor McGregor, June 29th, UFC 303. Who wins the fight? Conor McGregor's the betting favorite right now. Can he all be at slightly minus 120? Michael Chandler, the even money underdog, plus 100. 57% of respondents like the slight underdog, Michael Chandler. I know you were not expecting to be making a prediction on this fight today. Um, But I don't much care. Conor McGregor, Michael Chandler, June 29th. Who do you like? I think Conor is the better fighter. I think he's got more skills. I think he has more ways to win than Michael Chandler does. However, you know, Conor McGregor has so much going on. How much energy has he put into training for this? I I don't know. It's hard to tell. I mean, I'm what am I going off of social media and all this stuff? Like it's, it's hard to really know. Um, but right now I'd maybe be leaning towards Chandler, but I want to see more. I want to see footage. I want to see, uh, that Connor is focused training. I want to see him saying the right things. You know what Chandler is going to show up, you know? Um, and sometimes he brings too much chaos and recklessness into the octagon. Um, but you know, he's going to train hard and be ready. So, uh, with Connor, I'm not so sure, but skill wise, man, he is so talented. Um, but I'm excited for that fight, man. That that's going to be, that's going to be pretty special as well. And then Islam Akashev in defense of his title against Dustin Poirier at UFC 302. I think an interesting time for Poirier with confidence riding so very high to be getting this Islam Akashev fight. The Gaethje result, of course, was good for Poirier's case. What do you make of Dustin's chances here against uh, the thus far nearly perfect Islam Akashev? It's going to be extremely difficult for him to beat Mahashev. You know, again, just based on his last fight against another grappler, uh, no question for me that he'll be the more dangerous guy in the feet. Um, you know, he, if someone gets the knockout, perhaps it's Dustin Poirier against Islam Mahashev, and Islam has definitely been improving his striking skills. I, I like it there, but Islam is going to have the ability to take this fight where he wants. Where does he want it? 
on the ground. Uh, that's where he's going to take advantage and be able to move and, and out position Poirier, uh, perhaps for an eventual TKO or submission. So I like Mahashev's chances as of right now. All right. Thank you all for indulging us for this extended live UFC 300 recap. I did just want to say in closing at this live event, we acknowledge Chael Sonnen and Anderson Silva. Their fight from 2010 for the middleweight title will be inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame as part of our induction class of 2024. So Silva versus Sonnen won going into the UFC Hall of Fame. And I just want to say as somebody who has hosted this UFC Hall of Fame induction ceremony for a long time, we use these wings as conduits to get certain people into the Hall of Fame. Not to suggest that our Hall of Fame is perfect, right? But Chael Sonnen has been a major contributor to mixed martial arts, and I'm really happy for him to get this type of acknowledgement. He has brought a ton to the sport. He nearly realized the world championship at middleweight that he so badly wanted to produce for his late father. He was unable to do that, but he's continued to deliver, you know, as my colleague on the TV side. And I just think he's brought a lot of eyeballs to mixed martial arts. So, you know, even though he was absolutely filthy, maybe the night upon which he fought my good friend Brian Stan, you know, I hope Chael will understand that, you know, this fight wing is you used as a conduit to get deserving people into the Hall of Fame. And I hope that Chael Sonnen will, in that, uh, consider himself a UFC Hall of Famer. All right, we got to get on out of here. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. JohnAnnick.com for all of your merchandise needs. Promo code One More Sleep gets you 20% off of all the UFC 300 designs for One More Sleep, as well as all the Anik and Florian podcast merchandise as well. And don't forget KennyFlorianMartialArts.com if uh, if you want, want to become a badass like uh, like Max Holloway. Thank you to Ray Longo. Thanks to our producer, Cody Merrow, at the helm. And thanks to the entire Anik and Florian podcast family showing up, showing out in Las Vegas. Thanks to our sponsor, of course, Cuervo. Thanks to the DraftKings folks as well. And uh, we will be back either later this week or early next as we get ready for the next UFC fight night coming up uh, on April 27th. With that, for Ken Flo, I'm John Anna. Thank you all for watching, for listening. Until next week, don't text and drive. Yo fucking later.